Hi, welcome back. For today's video, I'm going to talk all about common orthopedic diagnoses that frequently pop up in both the office and on our nurse practitioner's board exam. I'll talk about the arthritis, ankle injuries, wrist pain, tendinopathy, knee pain, and then lower back pain. At the end of the video, as always, I included two dump sheets this time instead of one. One is dedicated all to arthritis, including osteoarthritis, rheumatoid, and then gout. And then the second dump sheet are the remaining orthopedic diagnoses that I'll discuss here. The sheets are meant to help you study and really hone in on some of the key points and clinical pearls for practice. Don't forget to leave me any comments or questions if you have any, and then subscribe to this channel if you have found any of these videos helpful for you in your studies. Now on to orthopedics. So the first orthopedic diagnosis that we're gonna talk about is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is one of those conditions that a lot of times we can diagnose simply based on clinical presentation. Um, symptoms usually will present, they'll have pain with the joints that they're using that are typically relieved by rest. They may experience a limited range of motion, swelling, and then if they are experiencing any kind of deformity, that is a late sign of the disease. We also, with osteoarthritis, we'll see what we remember as the Heberden and Bouchard nodes, and those are on the hands. I have a picture up here in the upper corner. I have messed these up so many times in my studies, remembering which one is the Heberden and which one is the Bouchard. So I started telling myself that the Bouchard is always in the middle of the finger, B is always in the middle, and I thought A, B, C, B is always in the middle, Bouchard is just the middle joint there in your finger. It worked for me. Other joints that are typically affected by osteoarthritis are going to be the knees, hips, those interphalangeal joints that we just talked about, the first CMC joints, first MTP joints, and then also uncommon, less common I should say, but also can be affected by osteoarthritis are the joints of the cervical and lumbar spine. So like I said, a lot of times these, um, this can be diagnosed simply on clinical presentation. And these are the three things that we really need to have for a diagnosis. And these are listed here in the yellow. So consistent joint pain related to joint use, um, 45 years or older, and then stiffness upon waking that lasts no more than 30 minutes. So if those things are present, then we can more than likely be comfortable thinking that this is osteoarthritis that's happening. X-rays are gonna be reserved for those uncertain diagnoses. For example, younger patients, like I mentioned previously, one of the criteria is that they're 45, year and, 45 years and older. So for those younger patients, we'll want to potentially do X-rays if they're having any systemic symptoms, any signs of inflammation or atypical symptoms, for example, increased pain with rest and at nighttime, that can be actually a concerning sign and would warrant us to get imaging. And then uh, if osteo, uh, osteoarthritis is present, then on x-ray a lot of times we'll see things like osteophytes or joint space narrowing, and that really will help support our diagnosis as well. And over on the right there is an x-ray showing that joint space narrowing, you can just tell, I think what they say is what bone on bone, it looks uncomfortable. So treatment, really non-pharmacological treatment is our first line and our mainstay for therapy for these patients. It includes things like exercise, light weight bearing, workout, aerobics, weight loss if that patient is overweight or, over, um, or obese, knee braces if it's mild to moderate impairment, a walking aid like a cane or a walking stick if it's more severe, and then also we could splint and particularly with the thumb that's been found to be very useful with the splinting. And then if we need to move on to pharmacological treatment, we're only gonna be doing that in the presence of symptoms. It's not a chronic thing. And when symptoms are obviously not improving with the non-pharmacological treatments. And really, it's our topical and oral NSAIDs. So, and then also I put in here too, capsaicin that can be used as well. The topical NSAIDs and the capsaicin are gonna be used only if there's one joint or a very minimal amount of joints affected, particularly the hands and the knees. Research has shown that those work best with those topical 
um, topical NSAIDs or capsaicin. And then oral NSAIDs when obviously if the topical is ineffective or if there's multiple joints affected by the OA, and then also particularly if the hip joint is the one that is affected, then oral NSAIDs are gonna work better there as well. And then also if NSAIDs are contraindicated or ineffective, there is a third line there and it's duloxetine or Cymbalta as we know, and that's just an option that the literature gives us when all else kind of fails. So next up is gonna be rheumatoid arthritis and hopefully this slide will help you differentiate between osteoarthritis. I know sometimes those can get mixed up. Rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory and an autoimmune disease. It's bilateral, inflammatory like I said, and a polyarthritis, so multiple uh, joints involved. And typically these do result in a deformity. So symptoms that are specific to rheumatoid arthritis is that pain in the morning, but it lasts longer than 30 minutes. So remember that cutoff for OA was actually, it takes them 30 minutes or less to get warmed up in the morning. RA, those patients are gonna take a lot longer to um, kind of warm their body up and for the pain to sub subside. So something important to know is the duration of time for how long these symptoms have been occurring. If they've only been experiencing for these, symptom, these symptoms for six weeks or less, then this could actually be attributed to a viral polyarthritis, and that is a temporary thing, and it's obviously not going to be the same as rheumatoid arthritis that is a chronic autoimmune disease. So for us to make a diagnosis, there are a few things that we're looking for. One, that it is indeed polyarthritis, so there should be three or more three or more joints involved. And then for diagnostic purposes as well, we'll get a, we, they would have a positive rheumatoid factor and then an elevated CRP or an elevated ESR to show the inflammatory process. And then of course, other similar diagnoses have been ruled out and symptoms, like I had said, have been occurring for longer than six weeks. Treatment here, there is well, for us in primary care, our job is gonna be able to identify it and then refer them to rheumatology where they do what is referred to as DMARD. I briefly have read about it, but disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug out of our wheelhouse, unless, of course, you do rheumatology, but really we wanna be able to identify what's going on and then get them to where they need to be. So next up is gout or gouty arthritis. And this, I feel like once you know what it is, you can always kind of pick it out. It is painful, warm to the touch, red and swollen. A lot of times it involves that first MTP joint, also referred to as the pedagra, which I got a picture up there at the top there. And these are caused by urate crystal depositions. And all patients at one point in their stage, or at one point in the disease will have hyperuricemia. Also, there is something tophaceous gout, which is chronic changes that have occurred from uh, gouty arthritis. The tophi are yellow in appearance, generally not painful or tender to the patient, and they can be seen many different places. One place in particular that they sometimes pop up will be on the ear, and there's a picture up there as well that you can see. So, like I said, a, a gout flare generally involves one joint. Typically, it's that first MTP joint or the pedagra. And it's usually precipitated by some kind of change in the patient's urate uh, concentration. And that can, be, that can occur from trauma, anorexia, malnutrition, uh, fatty foods, those that are high in purines, alcohol, diuretics, including both thiazide and loop diuretics, and then aspirin. All of those can contribute, contribute to a gout flare-up. A clinical diagnosis, there's actually... Um, guidelines here for you. Those are from, up, well, this is all from up to date, but these guidelines are to follow to make a clinical diagnosis of gout. If these things are present, you ta uh, tally up the points. So onset of symptoms within last 24 hours, joint redness, a history of hypertension or, C or cardiovascular disease, if they've had a previous gout flare-up, if they're male, if it is involving that first MTP joint, or if their serum urate is greater than 5.88. All of those things are risk factors for um, it being a gout flare-up indeed. Over there on the side, it says eight or higher indicates high likelihood and four or lower points, then we would wanna rethink our differential. 
So there's a couple of different options that we can do for treatment for gout, including systemic glucocorticoids, um, injection, or intra-articular glucocorticoids, NSAIDs, and then colchicine. Depending on our patient's risk factors will help us to decide which treatment we decide. For example, if they cannot do NSAIDs, if they have kidney problems or heart failure, different things that we're going to want to take into account, steroids and diabetes. And then um, colchicine, too, is a very effective drug, but it's not as effective if it's been 24 to 36 hours after the onset of symptoms. And then also patients want to be educated that very common side effect with colchicine is going to be uh, diarrhea. Still better than gout. So up next is going to be all about ankle injuries. And this is actually one of the most common presenting injuries that our patients will come in with. So sprains, they are graded one to three, one being the most mild and three being the most severe. So a mild sprain, they may have some swelling, some tenderness, but no joint instability, and they're able to bear weight. A lot of times these patients just treat themselves at home and don't even come in. Uh, sprain two, or a grade two sprain is a lot of times what we will see in like an urgent care setting. setting. That patient will have more moderate swelling, more moderate tenderness. Ecchymosis will be present now. They will have some joint instability on exam, some loss of function, and they're able to bear minimal weight, though it is very painful. Uh, grade three, a lot of times these patients go generally straight to the ER. This is a complete ligament tear. They'll have severe swelling, tenderness, and ecchymosis severe instability on exam and they are not bearing weight at all on this joint <clears throat> or on this injury. So a lateral injury is the most common sp uh, sprain and that's caused by an inversion. And this is when the toes point inside towards the body and pictures up there on the right show you the difference between an inversion and an eversion. And it kind of seems intuitive when you look at it I don't know anyone that's ever twisted their ankle like an eversion, but an inversion, that's a much more common injury. And good thing too, because those medial, medial injuries, they're a lot more complicated and they require referral. So if someone's coming in with an ankle injury, we're always going to want to make sure to palpate distal and proximal to the injury, make sure that there's no other injuries that we're missing. And then for diagnosis, a lot of these sprains can be diagnosed on clinical presentation again. However, if there is tenderness to the malleolar, or, which is the outside of the ankle there, or if they're unable to bear weight immediately after the injury, those could be signs that something else is going on, maybe a fracture, and we want to get an x-ray of the ankle. And then if they're having pain at the top midfoot area or tenderness at that fifth metatarsal or the navicular, those are big red flags as well. Also, if they're unable to bear weight again right immediately after that injury, then we want to we want to get imaging as well. For treatment, it's rice and NSAIDs, so that rest, ice, compression, and elevation, and then NSAIDs as needed for or PRN for their pain. And then I put down here at the bottom, just important for splinting purposes, grade one sprains, they're not gonna require a mobilization, but grade two will need some support in order for, to facilitate early reha uh, rehabilitation. So something like an air cast or a splint to kind of help them with pain and keep them moving. And then this is too new for boards as it came out in 2021, but still good to know for practice. There is, has been some research that has shown a new way to hopefully prevent lateral ankle sprains from occurring and it's just putting a padding on the lateral aspect of the athlete's shoe and that's supposed to help with reducing the incidence there. Just thought that was kind of interesting. So next up we're going to be talking about wrist pain and the first thing that we're going to want to do with this complaint is to establish whether or not it is acute or chronic pain and chronic is defined as more than three months. And being able to differentiate these will definitely help lead us down our differential path. So most commonly, wrist pain is, occurs from an overuse injury or from some kind of trauma. The most, one of the most common injuries or trauma that the wrist 
will occur incur is a called a FOSH injury, F-O-O-S-H, and that actually stands for falling on outstretched hand. And that can actually cause a scaphoid fracture. And there's a really cool way for us to be able to check for a possible scaphoid fracture just by, with our hands, and that's evaluating for snuff box tenderness. And so in that top right picture there, you can see where that patient's anatomical snuff box is. And you'll go ahead and palpate that area. If there's tenderness there, then that definitely warrants getting an x-ray as there could be a fracture. And then also there is something called curvane tendinopathy, and that is an overuse injury. And that's pain at the radial wrist and it radiates into the thumb. Quick interjection here, as I was playing this back and editing, I realized that I did not include this diagnostic test that we do in the office. And it is super useful for diagnosing the cure veins uh, tendinopathy. And that is the Finkelstein test. It's positive if that move provokes pain. And I recommend looking it up online or on YouTube to see how the maneuver is done but it is very useful for diagnosis. And there's something called the spica splint, and that can be very helpful for that kind of overuse injury. And I just popped a picture in there. That's something that you can actually get off of Amazon. And then another common complaint that we'll see with wrist pain is actually carpal tunnel syndrome. And this is compression of that median nerve. And there's a, a couple t uh, diagnostic tests that we can do in our office and that is the Tinel sign and the Phelan sign. Positive Tinel and a positive Phelan's, ta uh, Phelan's test highly supports a diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. And so I have pictures over there on the right that Tinel is where you're actually tapping on that median nerve, and then the Phelan's is when they are compressing it but with their positioning there. And so I, the way I remember it is Tinel for tapping, Phelan for praying, T for T, P for praying, or backwards praying. Or also, if you need a trick to help you remember that it's related to carpal tunnel, then sometimes, I and I thought of this as well, tap the brake and pray I don't get into a car accident. So you have your tap for your tunnel, your pray for your Phelan's test, don't get into a car accident. Tap your brake, pray you don't get into a car accident, carpal tunnel. <laughs> If you're having trouble remembering, then that's some, that's a way that you can try and maybe stick it into your brain. Um, so for treating carpal tunnel, then we're going to splint these patients. And even research shows that even if they're splinting just throughout the nighttime and not through the daytime, then that can still be very beneficial. Also, there are options like glucocortico inject, uh, injections and then also oral glucocorticoids as well, like prednisolone. And then last resort would be surgery. A lot of times we will need to get imaging done with wrist pain in order to confirm diagnosis. An, a an AP in a lateral view will always want to get. And then, of course, if they are experiencing that snuff box tenderness, then we'll get a scaphoid view. And then an oblique view if the AP are inconclusive or if we believe that there is a possible fracture, then we'll get that view as well. And then if the scaphoid x-ray or that view is negative, but that patient is experiencing tenderness there at that snuff box location, then it's recommended to repeat that x-ray in five to seven days. So up next, we're going to be talking about tendinitis. And that is exactly like what it sounds like, inflammation of the tendon. So generally this will cause persistent tendon pain causing sometimes loss of function. And then these are usually caused by overuse injuries or repetition, repeated movements. So elbow tendinopathy, there are a few exams that we can do in the office and try and to get a diagnosis based on clinical presentation. So there will generally be tenderness at the affected epicondyle and then pain with either wrist extension or flexion. And then Imaging is going to be warranted if there is decrease in mobility or if there are obviously any bony um, abnormalities, then we will get a AP, a lateral, and an oblique for x-ray. So the two, the big ones, the medial epicondylitis and the lateral epicondylitis, and the way that I keep those differentiated in my mind 
and is medial epicondyl epicondylitis is also known as golfer's elbow and so medial i think mostly men play golf because it's golfer's elbow mostly men play golf I actually happen to love golf, side note, but in this, it helps me think <laughs> mostly men play golf. So media, medial epicondy epicondylitis is the, the golfer's elbow. And then lateral epicondylitis is tennis elbow. And so I remember that with lateral is the one that has the T in it for tennis elbow. And then also this lateral epicondylitis will also occur from repetition or those rep um, repetitive movements for example like screwing with a screwing in a with a screwdriver so that repetitive movement can cause a lateral epicondylitis so treatment for this is going to be activity modification so reducing whatever those aggravating movements ha have them rest it possibly using bracing um, acetaminophen or NSAIDs and then if that's not working, we can always consider physical therapy. And then I am recommending icing. Okay, so we're going to change it up now and we're going to talk about our patient with knee pain. And so again, the, one of the, the, again, the first thing that we wanna figure out is if this is an acute or a chronic issue, is this related to some kind of tr trauma or accident? And are we, is, we, are we able to determine if there is an, a knee effusion present? So also, we want to identify where the pain is located on the knee. So is it the anterior, medial, lateral, or posterior aspect of the knee? And we'll just ask our patient to point to where the pain is. And if they can determine and point to a specific spot, then that's definitely going to give us some help as to what is going on. So there's two big things that can happen and are pretty popular on boards and it's the AC ACL tear and then a meniscus tear. So for the ACL tear that often occurs from a sudden change in direction. The patient after possibly landing for a jump made a sudden turn and they might hear a pop sound and usually Im immediately after this swelling will occur at that affected knee. And then significant effusion is seen here and instability is present. They'll have that positive Lachman anterior draw test and pivot shift test. For these, there's a little diagram there on the bottom that I feel like gives a pretty good indicator, but also there's some really good videos on YouTube showing you how to do the moves, the maneuvers, and then also if you have someone willing at home to let you practice, I recommend doing that for practice. But for the test, all you need to know is that a positive Lachman anterior drawer test or a pivot shift test is indicating an ACL tear. And then for the Lachman, the Lachman LAC are the first couple letters that's easy to correlate with an ACL tear. And then also anterior drawer test A starts with, starts with that ACL. And then it's the next one, meniscus. There's one, only really one big test left for diagnosing those like knee injuries or those tears, and that's the McMurray test. Luckily, same first letter as meniscus, so it's kind of hard to mess those up once you got them. But so a meniscus tear, that often occurs from like a sudden twisting, and they might feel more of like a tearing sensation in their knee, and this too will cause significant pain and swelling uh, substantial effusion, joint tenderness, they might actually lose the ability to fully extend or flex their knee as well. And so with that positive uh, McMurray test, McMurray is for meniscus tear. And so I also find like it's really helpful to look at that diagram there on the top and really see where the meniscus and the ACL are. And that kind of gives you just a better understanding why they're so painful and what to look for when they're pointing to where their pain is located. And then for treatment, that's gonna be rice again. So rest, ice, compression, elevation, crutches, they might need um, acutely to refrain from bearing any weight on that injured knee. And then we can use NSAIDs for pain. So lastly, I'm going to talk about lower back pain. And as always, first we're gonna to wanna to ask, is this acute or chronic? 
Majority of lumbar pain has lasted four weeks or less, and it doesn't require imaging. Chronic back pain, however, is going to be identified as uh, back pain lasting longer than 12 weeks. More than 85% of the lumbar or lower back pain is nonspecific and it doesn't have any underlying pathology. So that's comforting to know. However, there's still some emergencies here and we need to know them for practice, obviously, and then also for our boards. So for that general population where there is nothing acutely happening, then treatment involves heat, massage, acupuncture, exercise, physical therapy, and says obviously if not contraindicated. So along with determining acute or chronic, inspection is also really important with back pain. So we'll wanna inspect the patient's back and their posture. One way that we can do this, for, um, like checking for scoliosis, is we can have that patient stand in front of us and bend over and touch their toes. We'll be able to see potentially a curvature of their spine and then an unevenness in their shoulders that's really uh, indicator that there is some curvature happening obviously. Adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is a diagnosis that can be made if the onset of scolios scoliosis is 10 years or older with a greater than 10 degree curvature and then other etiologies have been ruled out so nothing congenital or neuromuscular. And then a couple terms that are important to know for, pra for boards practice also but lordosis um, is the one that I always remember, and then I know kyphosis is the other one. So lordosis, I remember that one easily because lordosis for lower back, and then kyphosis is where there's curvature of the upper back, kind of like a hump back. There's a picture in the upper right there if you need an image. Um, so yeah, like I said, imaging isn't usually warranted, or not initially warranted, unless there are some red flags. One also being if the pain is occurring from a trauma or an accident, obviously then we'll want to have some imaging done. If we have any suspicion of malignancy or if there are any neuro deficits, and this is a big one. And that's the cauda equina syndrome. And this is an emergency requiring a media MRI. Since they will have neuro deficits, including saddle anesthesia, and this is where they are experiencing loss of sensation in that pelvic region or that buttocks region. And then they could then, of course, experience incontinence or even retention. They'll experience motor deficits. Like I said, this is an emergency. If our patients are experiencing any of these symptoms, then we need to refer, send out. And then also something that can be causing that lower back pain is that lumbar radiculopathy. Over 90% are from that L5, S1, oops, there's just being one there, an S1 root. And so that's gonna be really important to know for your boards and for practice. And like I, this is, a, there's an easy test that we can do in our office as well. And it's there on the right, and that's the straight leg raise. And the patient, if they're having that lumbar radiculopathy, then they're gonna experience pain when we do that straight leg raise in between 10 and 60 degrees. Ha the, that will recreate their pain that they've been experiencing. And that is a positive sign. All right, and then as always, I will be ending these with my dump sheet that I have here for you. I actually have one more after this. This one is all the orthopedic conditions that we just discussed aside from anything arthritis. That's all there for you. I tried to color code it and organize it. I really like to color code things when I'm studying it helps to just kind of break it up and in my mind organize my thoughts, I guess. But so there is your first dump sheet. Go ahead and screenshot that and print it if it helps you. And then finally, the last dump sheet here is all arthritis. So osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and gouty arthritis. Hopefully these are helpful tools for you. If you check the link down below underneath in the comment section, I will have posted my Facebook group called The New NP where I also post my dump sheets and I include them in PDF format um, so you can print them out or you could go ahead and leave a comment down below with your name or your email or anything like that and I can try to get to them to you that way. Um, obviously free, all I ask is that if these are helpful to you and useful tools in your studying that you go ahead and subscribe to this channel. 
As always, I wish you guys the very best and I will talk to you soon. I hope you have a fabulous rest of your day. Mm -hmm.